guess I'm on the hot seat. Pardon? He said, I guess I'm on the hot seat. You guys are like beating me up. Mr. Campbell. <laughs> and let me, uh, speaking of Mr. Campbell, uh, let, let me do some introductions. Brian Campbell, a current council member, has joined us. Barbara Ferraro, a former uh, uh, council member, has joined us. Uh, Bill uh, James, one of my colleagues on the Planning Commission. Uh, Jim Guerin, who also uh, lives over at the Bay Club uh, and also with the Traffic Safety uh, uh, Committee, has joined us. Uh, Krista Johnson, uh, who's with uh, is an officer with Joa and uh, and Sphinx. Oh, that's right. Which one? The water oversight. Gosh, and here and here we are in the middle of a drought, and I forgot that. Thank you very much. And uh, Svein Vogner, who I, I forgot to mention before, is also a, a board member of the Sea Hill HOA. And my apologies for anybody else I, I may have left off. Uh, let's get started again. And uh, I had an ex I, I got a number of excellent suggestions, as I always do at halftime. Uh, but this, this time, uh, uh, let's go for two minutes, Bob, if we can. So maybe we can see if we can get some, some quicker, quicker pitch, questions. Pi pitch your questions. Uh, the next question, and Susan, we're going to Susan, we're going to start on, uh, oh, yeah. with you. Sure. Uh, power outages have become increasingly common in RPV. Today's uh, Easy Reader detailed uh, Easy Reader uh, detailed RPV hmm, joining. I guess that's joining other cities in solving the reimbursement issue. Uh, but as a council member, what would you do to help your fellow R uh, residents uh, with their reimbursements? Now, was that well, uh, was that as clear as mud, that, or, or that's, I'm that's not sure fine. I can clarify? That's basically, told the whole story. <laughs> yeah, please uh, begin. We've been trying to, as a council, as a council, we have been trying. This is really aggravating for everybody. And it is especially aggravating for council members because we really feel for our residents when we, their power goes out. Um, we've gone, to, I, two, two years ago, I went with Al Mirasuchi and we did legislation on this. And then this past year, um, David Hadley is working on legislation. And uh, Anthony Mizetich personally, what, he was living in uh, Miralast Hills at the time. And uh, he personally, I guess they were out 34 hours. So there, you know, <laughs> when a council member is out of power, it's like, oh yeah, we all know. But the community really is frustrated and we are extremely frustrated because we're learning that when your power goes out, they're not reimbursing us. So they won't even reimburse people when they mistakenly, it's not a planned outage, and when it is a uh, fault of theirs, they're not reimbursing us. So I believe that the demand in that, in that Easy Reader article, I just got the initial feed of it, was that they're demanding that Edison reimburse the, um, the cities and reimburse the residents. So, you know, we're dealing with a monopoly. And it's like, remember Ma Bell and then the whole breakup of Ma Bell? I mean, we are dealing with an obnoxious, arrogant monopoly. In fact, the director was removed. The director who served our cities is no longer working with us. I don't, and he's no longer, by the way, with the company. So um, we have complained as loud and hard as we could. I would say the best thing we could do at this point, since we're not in charge of the electric company, is to make sure that we let par uh, residents know they can get backup generators. And I think people should do that. Um, you know, we don't know what kind of power problems we're going to have, especially if there are people with medical illnesses or medical conditions that require that you have some kind of power. Um, it is so absolutely frustrating. I know the sound of a generator isn't so great, but it can become music to your ears when you're really out of power. So that's my answer. Very good. Thank you, you don't have to take the full time, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank, thank you very much. Jim? Interesting timing. Um, I am flying out tomorrow to go to San Jose to the League of uh, California Cities Conference. On Friday, I will be bringing forth a resolution that the City Council has passed to try to change the policies of Southern California Edison in terms of claims. 
Uh, it, was, it was spearheaded by our Councilman Misitich. And uh, the, the league seems to be very much in favor of it. Uh, the uh, uh, Assemblyman Hadley is in favor of it. What we're trying to do and what, we, what we're requesting that Southern California Edison do is they, you can go on their website, you can make a claim, but then they have, you have to prove that they have negligence for them to take your, uh, fulfill your claim. Well, that's, that's a court uh, type of issue that's resolved. So we're saying that they need to pay those claims if, if their infrastructure has failed. None, none of this business of negligence. If their infrastructure has failed and caused a power outage and you have a claim, they have to process it. That's the big change that we're trying to make through up there uh, and, and have the legislation do this. Uh, PG&E up north has a similar type of policy, so it's not out of the window to, to ask for this kind of uh, uh, service to our residents. And we are working hard to make sure, in terms of the reliability, and I've been working on this a long time myself, uh, with Manhattan Beach and some of the other people through the South Bay Cog, meeting with the PUC and trying to make sure that uh, Southern California Edison is investing the proper amount of money to keep their infrastructure in top shape. And this particular resolution will help motivate them to do that. Very good. Thank you. Jerry? <clears throat> Thank you again, Dave. Um, the current city council did take the lead on this. This has been a hot button topic in our city for a long time, stemming back to when dated uh, uh, equipment started the fires in the preserve. If you remember in 09, uh, if it wasn't for the grace of God and no wind that day, it could have been catastrophic. And that has to do with infrastructure, Southern California Edison's infrastructure. On more than one occasion, multiple members of the current council have taken Southern California to task publicly. You got to realize Southern California Edison is a public company. They're in it for profit, acting in a municipal capacity. And what, what troubles me is that, that there, there was almost a smugness in the answer, if you read the article um, from Southern California Edison. Well, you know, the, the number of claims that are regularly denied are mm -hmm. at issue, and they said, well, the redress is you can always bring legal action. Who the heck's going to bring legal action for $90 of food that, that, that uh, you know, melted because your power was out for 20 hours. But there are a whole host of problems. I, I, I would like to uh, uh, commend this council for bringing that forward. RPV is leading the way in this particular situation and on several other fronts. But uh, um, RPV sponsored it through the League of California Cities, um, and several other South Bay cities have signed on. And uh, it's, in, it's important that we do that because it, it shouldn't be perfunctory that claims are denied and said, oh, well, sue me. That's just not the way we do things around here. So I think it's a good thing. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, you talk about them being negligent. They've been negligent for years by not maintaining the infrastructure. That's the biggest problem. And to go there now and say, start maintaining it, that's like, you know, uh, letting the cat out of the bag and then try and get them back in again. Uh, the question is, do you want electricity or do you want money to pay for when you don't have it? Really, you want electricity all the time. And there was a time when you could get it all the time. So I think, you know, you not, need to look at other alternatives. Now, I'm not going to suggest you do this, but I've taken the following step. I'm putting solar up. And my solar panels are going to provide me with 98.6% of the total power usage I have at a peak load. The rest of it that I don't use gets banked, and I get to use it whenever I need it after that fact. <clears throat> Perhaps this is an incentive, other than just the money you get back from the government as an incentive to put it in. Uh, I looked at it from a different standpoint. I'm leasing mine. They ha I have a contract that they have to maintain it, and I just pay a very small rate per kilowatt hour, period, guaranteed for 20 years. In 20 years from now, I hate to think what Edison is going to be charging per kilowatt hour. So there's another alternative where you can take your own action to solve that problem and be, you know, environmentally friendly at the same time. Thank you. Greg? Um, dealing with Southern California Edison, it's really a David versus Goliath. Uh, you know, we want people to advocate for us, and, and kudos to Jim. I read the article today. Um, you know, I know he and, he and Doug were working uh, and advocating on behalf of RPV citizens. 
that's exactly what they should be doing, um, is advocating on behalf of, of all of us in order to get some kind of compensation. Um, I, I would imagine that the argument's gonna come in on SEE's side is what is negligence? Um, you know, and how you define that. If it's something where you've got normal maintenance that's supposed to be done on an annualized basis and they don't do it except every five years, well, then that seems like it would be negligence. But if they are supposed to be done on an annualized basis and they did it in 13 months, I would imagine that that might be looked, or they're, they're gonna look the other way on that. Um, but in terms of, of what we can do, it's like if, they, if they're saying you've gotta go and, and file your own lawsuit, the only kind of lawsuit that I can think that would actually get their attention would be a class action, and nobody in here is gonna try and do a class action. They're very complex. Um, you know, nobody, no individual is going to file a lawsuit. As Jerry had mentioned, it's like, I lost $90 worth of, of food. Um, nobody's gonna file a lawsuit over that. You know, it, it'll cost you more in court fees to file your small claims action. Um, if, if it goes towards something about, you know, medical issues, then you might have some damages, but then, you know, you're, you're, that's, at this point, I would, I would you know, let Doug and, and uh, in this particular case, uh, Jim, continue to advocate for us and see if we can get some lobbying and get some new laws that are gonna hold SCE accountable. Great, thank you very much. And Jerry, this one, uh, we're gonna start with you on this one. Uh, Did we skip Jim? I'm sorry. Jerry, yeah. All right, I'm happy to take this, go for it. No, he oh, I thought we got you, Jim. I thought we started with you, Jim. I think you started with Susan. I, I, I did the Edison and then. Now, and you're exactly right. Thank you very much, candidates. That's why they're the candidates and I'm the moderator. Jim, <laughs> we're, we're going to start with you. Uh, the, uh, and, and this question came to me in a variety of forms, but uh, just for the general public's benefit, uh, where are you on the proposed skate park for RPV? Yes, um, when this first came before us in uh, council, um, I was not in favor of this particular location at City Hall site. Um, I had some real concerns and issues with the safety. Uh, first of all, um, the, the skateboard has told us that they do use their skateboards for transportation, which I've seen and that's, that's fine. The situation here coming down Hawthorne is this, the streets, uh, sidewalks stop at Ballon Drive and then it's, it, it's just uh, the street is only available for skateboarding. Then you gotta cross over the left lane to get into the city hall. Um, now, not all skateboarders are gonna do that. Their parents will drop them off, but I'm just afraid there'll be some that may want to be tempted to do that. Um, I, I had a, uh, uh, an issue with the process. It didn't have enough public outreach, I think, initially. I think we needed to have more public outreach with it. Um, I, th I'm, I would like to see some skate facilities for the kids somewhere, and I think there might be some better locations, but I think the City Hall site has a lot of issues. We haven't quite vetted all of them. Um, for instance, uh, if the park is supposed to close at sundown, what's to prevent people or kids hanging out 12 midnight or 2 a.m.? Well, the only way to control that is to have an eight-foot high fence. Do we want that at City Hall? There's a lot of things we need to really look at with with uh, the issues we're ad addressing around this particular location, but I'm really concerned about the safety myself. Uh, there's Golden Cove down below. Again, no sidewalks. Uh, it's very tempting to go down and you get a Subway sandwich or something, and I'm just concerned about the location itself. Okay, thank you. Uh, and Jerry, now we'll get to you. Sure, thanks again, Dave. Um, as I've said before, I've been a, an advocate since before I got on council for a skate park in Rancho Palos Verdes, and I wanna, step back we, we we did quite a bit of work as a council we actually hired consultants we're looking at a dog park and a skate park location and we went through a lot of gyrations this is not something uh that that has been touted uh out there in the public now that we just came up with this and pulled this out of thin air this has been long discussed it was part of the parks master plan we insisted that that take place about a year ago so there's been a lot of discussion on this topic. It just didn't fall out of thin air. And there's some misconceptions, too, just to, create, to, to clear the record. It's not going to be privately owned. It's going to be privately funded, meaning someone's going to raise money, and it's going to be built. No private entity is going to own that. That's going to be a city asset, just to be crystal clear, because there's some misinformation on that also. Um, the, uh, the, the term skate park in and of itself is a misnomer. It's supposed to be a skate plaza. It's supposed to be multi-use. If you've looked at any of the drawings or renderings, 
There's a big stage associated with that in the shape of a wave in a conceptual drawing that, that when we have our 4th of July, we have a central plaza. Now there's a lot of work yet to be done on this. Where do you put it? How big do you do it? How it's gonna be funded? Um, safety issues according to Jim, security. But I think personally that City Hall is a good place to do it as long as it doesn't impede any civic center uh, work going forward in the future. Who knows when that's gonna happen? They've been talking about it for 30 years. You know, estimates are $30 million to build a civic center complex the way it's been drawn out 10, 15 years ago. But, but uh, a plaza potentially could serve the city well going forward. And there's a lot of other issues, uh, including the fact that we need to have uh, um, uh, rights, rights as a council. And they need to be clear that we need to be able, if there's a problem with that skate park, we're not going to uh, defer our rights to shut it down as a skate park. So there's a lot of moving parts to this. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Ken? Yeah, I, I kind of think uh, pretty much along the same lines as far as the skate park. I'm not opposed to skate parks per se, but to try and put something in, even though it's called the plaza now, when we don't know exactly how the city hall site is going to be arranged, we talk about the 4th of July. If you take a look at it, the 4th of July always had the stage clear over on the other side. Uh, perhaps that's a better location. But to have this plaza right at the entrance to the city uh, hall site, I think is not the best place for it. Yes, we've waited 30 years for that. There was a, actually we've waited longer because while I was on the council, we were talking about a civic center and a city council uh, room as well as a city hall site. But we need to move out more on the total plan get a civic center put together, then we'll know what we can include and where we can include it. In my mind, it's premature. Greg? I think it's worthy of conversation. Uh, I think you've got a multi-use skate park plaza that's gonna be used for multiple things. It's, if it's got a stage there, um, it's my understanding that more than 90% of the principals at the local schools support a skate plaza of some sort. Um, the City Hall site seems to me to be the logical place. I don't think that people want this in their neighborhood, and I think that it would be a, the, 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 the most logical place. I don't share Jim's concerns about safety and people going down Hawthorne Boulevard. I just don't see an eight-year-old getting on a skateboard. I don't see his mother letting him do that. Um, in terms of, you know, there, there could be issues also in terms of it uh, being a destination for people on the outside wanting to come in. Um, as long as it's gated, and I think that it's, um, there's some preference that is given towards the local residents, i.e. kids have school IDs, parents have uh, their own IDs, and if parents are bringing their kids, they can show a driver's license saying, we live on one of the cities on the hill, then we're gonna be okay doing that. In the event it's outside people, then do something similar to what PV does with the, uh, the beach club where they charge $30 a day for the pool. Um, you can actually do that. Um, it's similar to what we do with Abalone Cove. We give preference to, to PV residents, our PV residents, where they can actually park down there for free um, as long as you show your, your ID. But a lot of it, I think, boils down to what does the public want? What do people want? And I would listen to that. Um, if I end up getting a survey that basically says I've got 900 people that says we don't want it, that say don't we don't want it, and 150 that say we do, well, you know what? Then I think we got to go with the 900. But if it's the opposite way, then I think that we need to entertain that conversation and give the kids a safe place to play. Okay, Susan. Yeah, that's an interesting point. A, a lot of changes have taken place in the last couple of years since this concept came forward. You know, it started with Rolling Hills Estates. You all know we have 17 parks. Rolling Hills, and we have the preserve on top of that. And then Rolling Hills Estates has Ernie Hallett Park and another small park. And Rolling Hills has zero parks. And Palos Verdes Estates has zero parks. So that puts Rancho Palos Verdes in charge of the responsibility for all these parks. Now, with the social media frenzy, we're in charge of maintain, maintaining them and enforcing them and getting additional sheriff protection when needed, traffic in the neighborhoods and the communities. So is, and I would have to say that uh, Jim mentioned that the process had an issue. 
I have been a convert. I do think we need a skate park on this peninsula. The, you know, it's called the hill for a reason. I mean, we're in Rancho Palos Verdes, and we are the most hilly of all the cities. If you think about it, Rolling Hills Estates is a lot flatter. My concern is that within the last several weeks, we've gotten barraged with deluged with letters from residents who are saying they do not want it and they were not informed. I have stepped forward with the city staff to find out what's going on. Um, you know, this isn't the only issue this happened on. This also occurred with the residents in the Island View. They were not aware that their parking permits were going to be enforced. So I want to point out that I'm concerned about the process. I want to listen to the people. I want to do what the residents want. There are residents that do live around the City Hall, and they live right above it and right below it and all around it. So um, I want to make sure this is something that the community wants, and we have to find the right place for our kids. Thank you, Thank you Susan. Uh, before we get to the uh, concluding remarks on the candidates, one last question, and it's kind of an explosive one. Uh, and I, I would just say before I ask this question, I realize that some people may be able to answer it and some people not. Uh, Green Hills has been in the news a lot lately. Uh, how did this happen and what are we doing about it? Um, and we're starting with Jerry. Hey, no, we Jay, maybe, yeah, we, we've got a lot going on as a council, so three of us are basically going to be recused yeah, from can. answering that, so might I suggest a new okay. question? I think that's wrong. Yeah, uh, they can no, answer. We'll go, we'll go to because we'll all you're asking about what is on public I, I, record. I, I, actually, uh, Greg, I'll take uh, care of it. Can, respect, go ahead. You're, we're not wrong. We, we've been advised uh, yeah, I, uh, in Jerry, closed session as to what we Jerry, can say I, and not say. Jerry, I understand. Can can answer the the, the question, please? Me? Yeah, if you want to. If you don't, you don't have to. I think it's premature to make any kind of comment on it now because all the facts aren't in. Uh, it's being looked at. And until we know all the facts of who's got the responsibility, what the state law says, uh, what responsibility our city has to residents that are not in our city, uh, we need to know answers to those questions before we can make an informed decision. Very good. Greg? Um, there's been at least five public hearings by the Planning Commission, hours upon hours of these public hearings, outside investigations. And as I understand it, one of the main guys is still working in City Hall. Um, where was the council oversight for our city attorney over the last four years? Um, are there unclean hands? It would appear that there are. Um, who's at fault? The study that the city ordered, it, it certainly shows that we bear some of that responsibility. That's a public document. So um, I, I just don't, you know, I, and I, I'd want to know, you know, how are we addressing this? How are we trying to make sure that this doesn't happen again? What is it that we're trying to do? That's certainly not privileged information. Um, you know, one of the council people, you know, on live TV was, you know, got up there and basically said, well, why don't we just close the mausoleum and, and disinter the bodies and the remains? I'm sorry, but that's morbid. That's just wrong and on so many levels. And, you know, to suggest that, and then the idea that if there's a hundred people that are buried there, you, you've disrespected all their families, and from a city's point of view, you're walking into probably a hundred new lawsuits. We probably already got at least three with the folks over in Lameda right now. We're trying to resolve those and get through them. Um, it's going to turn into a transaction. As a transactional lawyer, that's what I do. I understand that. And the problem that I think that we have with our current council is there's nobody on council that has a legal background that understands this. And they can't advise the, or they can't even ask the questions of the city attorney. That's the, that's the big problem. Good, thank you. Uh, Mr. And uh, uh, wait a minute. I, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, if, I'm sorry. Dave? We're gonna go to the final comments. Uh, Dave, I just have rolling. to make a correction. I'm sorry, because I was just, you, you know, I was going to start on your side, okay, Susan, so I, come on up. Thanks. I, no, I'm... Come on, unless you want to sit there for just a while. I'll, I'll just stay here. Okay. Um, I just want to make a correction. Um, Mr. Royston was referring to a comment I made regarding companion plots and disinterring if people were going to be buried in companion plots, not disinterring anybody that is there that is already on that grounds. And I will just say that that was a... 
That was a uh, cheap shot. Hmm? So with that note, I would like to caution people that going forward, I mean, you know me, I've been here for 30 years and I've been dedicating my life to this community. I answer all your phone calls, I answer your emails, I answer your letters, I have monthly coffees when I'm available, and we are there together for the betterment of this community. I urge you to be very cautious from any mudslinging and any lowbrow tactics that could take place from this point on. We are less than, we are about four and a half weeks away from this election. So this is just really the kind of um, tactic that Rancho Palos Verdes, we are now a destination city and we deserve world-class leaders to represent us. Uh, I don't want to see this kind of activity and I think that you don't either. Um, I am here to protect us and to preserve our paradise. That's my, I love this city. This is my passion. I am only here for you. I do not get, I'm not here for any personal glory. It is really to see to the needs of our residents. I put the residents first. Um, I am humbled and I'm honored by the hundreds of people who are supporting me and by the um, contributions I've received, which are uh, significant. My main endorsements, I would say, um, first of all, thanks to all those supporters, and my main endorsements include Supervisors Kanabi and Antonovich, Congressman Ted Lieu, Assemblyman Hadley, Senator Allen, the LA County Business Federation who came in yesterday, uh, Councilman Mizitich, several former mayors, including Ferraro, Lyon, Wolowitz, Shaw, and Long, several homeowners presidents, nearly all the commissioners and committee members, and hundreds of supporters, but you, the citizen, are equally, if not more important, <laughs> and, and uh, actually equally important. Um, I hope I've earned your trust. My name is Susan Brooks. I ask for your vote, vote, and not your vote, your vote. And I would say that, you know, we are blessed. I would ask you to take a copy of this little brochure. Look us up on susanbrooksrpd.com, sign on. We are there together to work together. I encourage you also to support my two colleagues who are sitting next to me. We have worked so hard and come so far that it is extremely important that this group stay together because we have put that time in for you. And now we need to see the results of our efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jim, concluding remarks? Okay, yes, thank you. Um, I have been and always will have one primary goal for my service to the city, and that's preserving the quality of life. We all moved here for a reason, and I tell you, it wasn't cheap real estate. <laughs> it's because we have a high quality of life here, and I've always been dedicated to trying to maintain that. But what does that mean? Uh, I've been involved many years preserving the open space, so we have natural open space. If you look at a satellite of our city, we have a beautiful green oasis here compared to the cement jungles and other areas, which is why people are coming in to, to enjoy our areas. Uh, the Planning Commission is a strong advocate of neighborhood compatibility. Uh, people are allowed to improve their homes, but it has to be compatible with the neighborhood. And we don't want to have mansionization of our neighborhoods. I was a very strong proponent of that. Uh, also, I, uh, we live in a safe city, but we have to keep vigilant because these things change. And we, as I mentioned, there's Prop 47 uh, that's come forth, and there's been some increased burglaries. We have to keep vigilant with this. And so, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a strong advocate of supporting the sheriffs and getting out to the community <coughs> and making sure the community understands the crime trends in their neighborhood as well as how they can prevent it. Uh, fiscal prudence, I think that's very important uh, of our quality of life. We have a healthy reserves. Uh, we have a balanced budget, but as we mentioned earlier, there's infrastructure uh, requirements we have, and we'll have to prioritize those infrastructures and make sure we use our, your money wisely. And it, it, this also includes using your taxpayers' money wisely. Uh, while I've been on the South Bay COG, um, I've investigated, for instance, our street lights. Um, I got a bill from the uh, city for uh, $300,000 for various street lights from Southern California Edison. I demanded to do an inventory. We found nearly 80 lights that didn't exist. 
<laughs> so um, I've saved the city a lot of money by investigating these things and, and, and trying to find ways to save, save and, and make our city more efficient. Um, it's, it's always been my policy to fully research all the issues and make sure I understand the, the residents, which are an important thing of your input to us, and making a, a fair decision that's for the benefit of everybody. <coughs> I, at the beginning, I mentioned the various agencies I'm part of. Um, I have still more work to do, more money to save you and the city, uh, and more representation for the city uh, for legislation. And so I, I'd like to go forth and continue that work for you and bring those opportunities to you. Uh, my website is palsverdes.com forward slash Jim Knight for more information. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jim. Jerry? Yeah, before I proceed with my closing comments, I did want to state for the record that, that the other two council members, the Mayor Pro Tem and myself, we are fiduciaries and sworn agents of the city uh, under advice of council, our new city attorney, we are not to speak publicly about the Green Hills matter, so it's not as simple as us ducking the question. I have a lot to say on the topic. So just to be crystal clear, we, we have a different responsibility and liability potentially than, than candidates who aren't sworn at this point in time. So that's okay. for the record. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, um, thank you again, everyone, for being here tonight and, and uh, allowing us to uh, share our thoughts with you. Uh, thank you to the Long Point HOAs and, and all the presidents associated there with for sponsoring this event. And Dave, thank you for emceeing. Very kind, sir. Uh, Bob, Bob Nelson, you were an excellent timekeeper. Thank you. Uh, again, as I always do, I'd like to thank my wife, Roseanne. She flew cross country since about 6 o'clock this morning and showed up here tonight. So thank you, honey. My two daughters, my mother in the back, and, and many friends in the crowd. Thank you. Uh, again, as I always say, to uh, being on council is a family affair. Thank you to my fellow candidates. Somebody said it earlier, they should be commended for throwing their hat into the ring, and uh, it's a taxing exercise. It takes a lot of time. People put their own money into it. Again, it's not for the fame and glory, so, so they should be uh, commended also. Finally, to the residents of RPV, I'd like to thank you. I am constantly amazed at the outpouring of support and knowledge and input that we get from all of our residents. You are our number one resource. Uh, and I believe you are truly some of the best residents in the country. You make this a very special place, as, as I think we would all agree. Um, in closing, I'm going to share a pearl of wisdom, and I know my wife is going to cringe again, as she always does. A, a mentor of mine said, perfection is a road and not a destination. And, and I live by that. We are never going to be perfect. We strive to be perfect. We're, we're flawed on multiple fronts. Uh, as I said in my opening, we are very lucky to be living in RPV, and it's a great city. We have very admirable and, and enviable characteristics. We have financially sound, have a nice surplus, we have abundant open space, great schools, uh, very involved citizenry, uh, as Susan said, 17 parks, a beautiful seven and a half miles of coastline, and, and views beyond compare. Uh, with that being said, we're not perfect, we can get better, and uh, I want to be part of making this city better. If elected, I promise you good governance. I promise to continue to provide strong, common-sense leadership in conducting the city's business. I will always make every decision based on what I think is the best interest of the city as a whole and all of its residents. I will always tell the truth. I will listen to all viewpoints, and I will treat every individual with respect. Uh, there's a lot of work still to be done, and you have several candidates to choose from. I ask that you vote for an experienced, committed problem solver a consensus builder and proven leader who is not afraid to step up and make a tough decision and who will work tireless, tirelessly on your behalf and behalf of all residents. If you haven't figured it out, I'm talking about me. So. <laughs> I respectfully ask for your vote on November 3rd, and I'd just like to say God bless America and thank you to those who protect us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jerry. Ken? Thank you very much, and thank you to the Homes Associations that sponsored this and the people that have come. We've talked a lot about a number of issues, and there's a couple that we didn't touch on that I'd like to touch on. And that's the idea of stopping unnecessary taxes. We have paid taxes and expect certain services from our city, but it seems every time we want a new service, our taxes aren't enough. They change it to a fee. It's just another three-letter word that's different than tax and spelled differently, but it's got the same impact. Legally, we're not bound by what a previous council may have committed the city to. But morally, I think we do. 
During the uh, process of getting Taranea built, there was a lot of talk about the storm drain user fee. And it was stated in a number of council meetings that once Taranea came in and started providing some money, that would be used to help defray the cost of the storm drain user fee. You've been paying that tax now. It's going to sunset. I understand the council is thinking whether or not it should be reinstated. I wonder just exactly how good the accounting is when the actual ordinance says uh, something different than storm drains. It says water quality and uh, storm control. Uh, so I'd like to see some of that POT used to that. As far as having a large surplus, sure we do. You can always have a large surplus if you spend nothing. Yet we've got infrastructure and other things that need to have money spent on it and we're not spending it. We have a reserve that's well over the 50% that the council has indicated they want it as a reasonable reserve. So let's not look at more taxes. Let's start using the money we've already paid for to get some of the things done. The last thing I'd like to touch on is one of the, fault, the, the faults I have with the city process is resident input. The agenda comes out Thursday night. Residents get it about Friday. They get a big report, and they have until Tuesday to read it, understand it, think about it, and come up with cogent responses. And then the council gets late correspondence handed to them just at the beginning of meeting. I wonder if any of them have the time to read it, the time to digest it, and the time to give it some thoughtful consideration. <coughs> to my mind, that's not very effective. We have grants that are provided and you get a period of commentary. Sometimes 30 days, EIRs get 90 days. Why wouldn't it be possible to have the council bring a subject forward, provide a commentary period up to the next meeting. I think it can be done and would help. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Greg? Um, thank you all for coming out. Um, I, first, I wanted to respond to Ms. Brooks, and I, I would simply say I would encourage people to watch the replay of the city council meeting. Sometimes when people say things on TV, it's painful to watch, even if it's yourself. Um, the words don't lie. Um, Thank you again to Long Point and C Bluff for putting uh, this event on this evening. Um, we're doing well here in RPV, but I think we could be doing better, a lot better. As I stated earlier, our best days are in front of us, not behind us. If voters see fit to trust me with their vote, they can count on me for this. I'll listen, I'll ask questions, and I won't drag my feet, particularly on matters of Im as important as public safety. I'll bring my legal and business experience to the table, I'll be fair and I'll check my ego at the door. You know, there's a certain amount of hubris that comes into play with people in public office. And I think it's important to acknowledge that you may not always have the best answer and that sometimes you might even be wrong. If there's one thing that I've learned from being married and from being a dad is I'm not right nearly as often as I think I am. As a dad and a husband, I have no choice but to check my ego at the door. And I think the same should be true with city council. I'm not infallible, I know I'm gonna make mistakes, but people need to know that they can count on me for integrity and know that when I make a decision, it will be because I've analyzed all the facts, listened to all the points of view, and that the decision I make will be because I think it's in the best interests of everyone. People may disagree with me, but they won't have to worry about whether there's an ulterior motive on whether I vote on something or bring something to council for its consideration. I live in RPV, I don't do business here. In sum, the residents can count on me for this. I will ask questions and get answers. I will hold all parties accountable that are doing business with the city through audit, whether it's the city attorney, city staff, or the consultants and vendors doing business here. No exceptions, period. Thank you for coming out tonight, and I'd like to thank you in advance for your support. I'd be humbled, honored, and very appreciative if you vote for me on November 3rd. Thank you. And just a, a few uh, concluding remarks. Uh, how about that? We got out of here five minutes early. Uh, you know, local democracy is the purest form of democracy, and I really appreciate our audience 
and I really appreciate uh, our candidates tonight. Let's give them one final round of applause. And there's one special person I forgot to introduce earlier who uh, just put her uh, paper to bed. Uh, Megan Barnes from uh, from the Peninsula News uh, uh, joined us, and she she worked on her paper all day to, to get it out uh, for for tomorrow. So she joined us a little bit late. And thank you, Megan, very much for joining us. Uh, coffee and cookies, decaf coffee, lots of great cookies, uh, still in the back. Uh, thank you to the sponsors and. Uh, Again, the candidates are going to be here for a while. If, you, if your question did not get answered, ask them now. And uh, don't forget to pick up the materials and the contribution envelopes outside. Thank you very much. Hey.